Most of the offline input devices have to store the input data in some form for later processing. The primary storage within a computer, as you know, is of limited size and its contents are volatile. However, large amounts of data can be stored on a permanent basis on secondary or auxiliary storage media. In most computer systems, it is these secondary storage components that supplement the primary storage. The media used for secondary storage usually use magnetic technology and come in different shapes, sizes and storage capacities. The devices for secondary storage are used for both storing as well as retrieving since the same device head allows both writing as well as reading. This is very similar to the playhead of our audio systems at home that can not only play back pre-recorded music but can also record new music. One can see a clear distinction among secondary storage devices depending on the kind of data access they permit. Sequential access devices and direct access devices. Sequential access devices allow data to be accessed only in a particular sequence. In everyday life, one can consider the regular audio cassette player as a sequential access device. One can play and listen to the fourth song only by playing or fast forwarding the preceding three songs. Similarly, in computing technology, magnetic tapes, the earlier punch cards and paper tapes are examples of sequential access media. In order to access the ninth record on a tape, one must go through the preceding eight records. Because of the extra time taken for the drive head to get aligned onto the correct record, sequential access devices were relatively slow. Hence, the stored data has tended to be offline from the processor except when loaded on an input device. Unlike sequential access devices, Direct Access Storage Devices or DAS-T allow data to be accessed exactly from the point where it was actually stored irrespective of what data appeared before it. Data retained in these secondary storage devices favors online applications and is available to the processor at all times. Most of these devices use disks as the storage media, examples of which are magnetic disks and optical disks. The disk media are made up of concentric circles called tracks and each track is further logically divided into sectors for creating units of storage. The data is stored along these tracks as tiny invisible polarized spots. Compared with primary storage, the capacity of a DASD is much larger and the cost per bit stored is lower. Having understood the access modes and location, you will be in a better position to appreciate the factors that are responsible for the choice of one storage method over the other. Let us see a simple illustration of this in a pyramidal fashion. As you can see, the higher you go in this pyramid, you get faster access time at a higher cost but lower storage capacity. While actually using the computer, you may be faced with choices of storage and you can now use the priorities against each factor to make your final selection. Direct access devices seem to have become more popular than sequential devices. The commonly used media that allow direct access are disks like magnetic disks, RAM disks and magnetic bubbles, optical disks or compact disks. By far the most popular medium for direct access secondary storage has been the magnetic disc. All magnetic discs are round metallic or plastic platters coated with a magnetizable recording material. Over the years, these evolved into many different sizes and capacities. Large 14 inch Winchester disc drive, small 9, 8 or 5 and a quarter inch floppy disc, miniature 3 or 3 and a half inch diskettes. The phonograph record had a visible circular continuing groove starting from the larger outer circumference and ending at the smaller inner circumference. No matter what the size, all magnetic disks have invisible concentric grooves that do not touch or connect with each other in any way. These invisible grooves are called tracks and the tracks are again logically divided into pie-shaped wedges called sectors to form units of storage. 
the disc is rotated by a motor at a high speed while the drive head shuttles back and forth to position itself over the required track in the case of floppy disks the read write head comes into actual contact with the disk whereas in the case of larger disks the head flies on a cushion of air a few micro inches above the disk surface in the case of disk packs or cartridges where there are two or more disks mounted together the drive has multiple heads one for each disk side attached to multiple axis arms the larger the number of accessible disk surfaces the larger is the capacity of the storage device the component popularly called the hard disk in most pcs is a winchester type storage disk the ram disk is actually a misnomer because it actually isn't a disk at all and has no moving parts it is a bank of semiconductor ram chips used as a simulated disk to replace the mechanical operations of rotating disks this is perhaps why they are also called silicon disk or pseudo disk these ram disks are placed on add-on circuit boards that fit inside the computer's motherboard magnetic bubble storage also uses semiconductor chips that have no movable parts however unlike the ram disks they retain the information even when power is turned off the main advantage of using ram disks and magnetic bubble storage is in their access speed instead of waiting for a drive head to locate and read the data to be loaded from a physical disk the data in ram disks and magnetic bubbles can be accessed directly from the active semiconductor chips you may be familiar with the prevalence of consumer media such as audio cd roms vcds and dvds in the fields of entertainment all of these use the optical storage technique which is a combination of light and magnetism technology this same optical technology has also been used to develop optical disks for computer data storage these are typically called cd rom compact disk read only memory optical storage disks Optical disks are usually pre-recorded by the firms that manufacture the disk title by burning pits into the thin outer coating. The pit patterns represent the stream of digital data that are used to encode images and sound. Since users do not actually do the writing on the disk, these are primarily read from and hence called ROMs or read-only memory. These disks require optical drives wherein a beam of laser light which has no contact with the disk surface is used to read the data optical disks have enormous storage capacities very fast access time and very low storage cost you can pack a 33 volume encyclopedia britannica into one optical disk and still have space to store more data apart from cd roms there are optical disks that are designed to be written once and then read many times These are called worm or write once read many systems. For these the user may use a laser recording device that stores the data patterns by melting, bubbling or in some way deforming the thin outer layer of the disk. Thereafter the disk can be read as many times as required. Today the computing industry has seen the introduction of writable CDs. These can be written onto by CD writers that are about the same size as CD reading units and may be external units or units that are attached to the PC on your desktop. As you have seen, the evolution of direct access storage has in many ways overtaken sequential access storage but can never really completely replace it. Recording techniques till today have used the horizontal recording approach wherein the writing surface utilized is more The perpendicular recording approach and other similar advancements will significantly reduce the surface area used and allow for more density of data to be packed into the same surface space. While development will continue towards miniaturization and larger capacities, the storage hierarchies will continue to exist. Faster systems adopting the latest technology will tend to be more costly than slower systems with larger storage capacity. Essentially what has happened is that optical media has allowed for the merging and packaging of all kinds of data including text animation images
sound maps and narration onto one single medium. This has made the human-computer relationship more interactive, real and stimulating. It has opened doors for revolutionizing every aspect of our lives, from education to entertainment and the realms of virtual reality. The primary reason for us to use computers is to help us process input data to produce meaningful output. It goes without saying that good output information helps in good decision making. Good decisions lead to the effective performance of organizational tasks and good performances lead to faster reaching of the organization's goals. A good output should be accurate, timely, complete concise and as relevant as possible. And we cannot forget that good output depends very greatly on good input and good programming. Computer output can be obtained in different forms and the choice of one over the other depends on factors such as who will use the output, how quickly is it required, how much of it is required. Like input data, Output can also be grouped as internal or external to differentiate between people who will use it. Internal output will typically be used by people within the organization, while external output will be used by those outside the organization. Hence, the need for good computer output cannot be ignored in the light of it promoting better understanding of the issues and achievement of specific goals. Essentially, most computer processing results in any one or more of the following types of output. Displayed output, computer graphics, printed output, filmed output, or voice response. Displayed output on VDTs or PC systems on the desktop is perhaps the most common form of output. This output is displayed in alphanumeric form as letters, numbers, and special characters. The format of most monitors is about 24 or 25 lines with up to 80 characters on a line, thus accommodating about 2000 characters. Most desktop workstations and PC models use the CRT or cathode ray tube screen. There are two kinds of CRT display screens, monochrome and color. In monochrome screens, a single electron gun sends a beam of electrons to trace a regular pattern of horizontal lines in the phosphor that coats the screen surface, which are typically black, green or amber. Colored screens use three separate signals for the colors red, green and blue. Hence, these screens are often called RGB display screens and can support a higher resolution than a monochrome. Other than CRT technology, Liquid crystal display or LCD is also used for display screens, particularly on portable systems like laptops and notebooks. This is the same LCD display technology you may have seen on some digital watches and calculators. The LCD system is much lighter and flatter than the bulky and heavy CRT system. LCD screens use a special liquid that is sandwiched between two plates. While the top plate is clear, the bottom plate is reflected. The molecules in this liquid are generally aligned so that light passes through the bottom surface and reflects out through the top surface. Earlier, LCDs produced dark displays on a silver background. While today, many color LCDs are also being developed. We all know that graphical representation of data can be better understood, related to, and retained than textual data. In cases where computer output shows relationships, changes, and trends, the significance of it all can get terribly lost under volumes of numeric data. In such cases, graphs, charts, maps, and other visual aids prepared from the statistical data are far more interesting and better absorbed by viewers. It is believed that graphical representations tend to create loss of detailed information. However, the advantages of the visual impact far outweigh this negligible loss. Apart from graphic representations, drawing packages also produce a graphic image output, complete with a vibrancy of colors. Most graphic outputs are visible on the screens. 
Permanent or hard copies can also be maintained by using the following graphics based output devices. Printers, plotters and camera photographs. A plotter releases ink over the paper it traverses based on the signals it receives from the computer. Plotters use either of the pen or inkjet approaches. Pen plotters generally come in two kinds. Drum holders in which a paper is placed over a drum that rotates back and forth to produce an up and down motion while the pen plots. Flatbed plotter in which the paper doesn't move and the mechanism holding the pen provides all the motion. Apart from pen plotters, there are inkjet plotters capable of producing large drawings containing many colors. After display screens, printers are the most popular output devices. They allow us to retain a printed and permanent copy of the output, also called a hard copy. There are broad classifications of printers based on how they print. You can have a division of character printers, line printers and page printers, depending on whether they print a character, line or page at a time. You can also divide them on the basis of impact and non-impact printers, depending on whether the print head makes or does not make an impact on the paper. Impact printers work like a typewriter by pressing a typeface against an inked ribbon which makes the mark on the paper. However, for simple understanding, we have discussed each printer individually and highlighted the mode, speed and cost aspects of each. Low speed character printers, low speed page printers, high speed impact line printers, High Speed Non-Impact Page Printers The Daisy Wheel Printer is a character printer of the impact kind. The print head in this looks like a daisy, with petal-like spokes at each end of which is a character. Since an actual impression of the character gets hit on the ribbon, the resultant characters on paper are very neat and clear. Also, the daisy wheels are interchangeable thereby allowing the user to use different font faces available on different daisy wheels. Although daisy wheel output qualifies for letter quality print, the process of printing with these printers is slow and noisy. They are usually found for low volume jobs in offices and homes where letter quality is necessary but speed and noise is not a consideration. You can use any paper on a daisy wheel printer and its inexpensive cost makes it affordable. The dot matrix printer is another impact type character printer. In a dot matrix printer, the head is a matrix arrangement of tiny hammers. These hammers strike the ink ribbon to produce dots that are closely linked to form the desired character. Typically, early dot matrix printers used to have seven hammers across by nine hammers down. Later and more expensive ones have more number of dots per square inch, resulting in a finer and higher resolution in printing. Dot matrix printers typically are found in two sizes, those that can print 80 columns across and those that can print 132 columns across. You can use any quality of paper for these printers, although the size of the paper will be dependent on the size of the printer. All dot matrix printers can generally print in four modes, normal, condensed, draft or near letter quality or NLQ. The sturdiness and low cost of these printers have made them the popular choice in homes and offices. The disadvantage of these printers is that the speed is very slow since they print a character at a time and prolonged use may result in the hammers getting bent leading to illegible and distorted characters. Thermal printers are non-impact type character printers and as the name suggests, work on the principle of heat. They use a heat sensitive paper and the print head burns the shape of the characters onto the paper without coming into contact with it. These are silent printers that have been found useful in hospitals and key areas of corporate activity. The output quality is very neat, although extra care has to be taken to maintain the paper used for printing. The material used and the technology of printing make them relatively expensive for common use. Inkjet printers are also non-impact, 
character printers that work on the principle of electrostatic fields. The print head in these printers is fitted with a nozzle that fires a stream of electrically charged ink drops in the shape of a character onto the paper. One can use any quality of paper on these printers. Today, one can see the prevalence of colored inkjet printers, wherein the head has four different nozzles, each ejecting ink of one color. Typically, these are CMYK color printers where the colors are cyan, magenta, yellow and black. Any other color or shade is a combination of the right proportion of each of these colors. Inkjet printers are less noisy and less expensive than dot matrix printers. Laser printers are perhaps the fastest printers available today. They are non-impact page printers that use the laser beam technology. These printers use laser lights to produce dots needed to form pages of characters. The print quality is the best amongst all printers and you can use any kind of paper. They can be monocolor or multicolor printers. Laser printers are high speed printers which can typically print at speeds of over 20,000 lines per minute. Other high speed page printers that can be compared to the laser printer are those that work on principles of xerography, electronics and other technology. They are expensive and very useful in high volume print jobs requiring letter quality. The high cost is leveled out by factors such as speed, volume and quality of printing which have made these printers economical and commonplace in universities, corporate houses, advertising and media firms. No matter what printer is used, every printer has its own memory into which it receives data from the processor for printing. However, the size of this memory versus that of the processor memory is not the same and hence print jobs, particularly in the line and character type of printers, are very slow. There are times when the computer appears to take its own sweet time to complete a print job before allowing you to perform any other computing task. The two approaches that allow large systems and users to operate their PCs normally while the printing is in progress are Spooler program which allows the processor to alternate between processing a user's ongoing activity and controlling the printing process Printer buffer which is an additional storage that complements the printer's memory. The buffer can store the input as fast as the computer can send it and then releases the data to match the printer's speed while the computer is free to perform its operation. Many organizations, universities and research laboratories need to capture volumes of reports for future use. These are originally printed on paper but then need to be archived onto a medium that allows maximum storage in minimum space and would remain intact for long periods of time. Computer output to microfilm or COM technology can be used to record the computer output information as microscopic filmed images. In some cases, the computer output may be read onto a magnetic tape and then in an offline operation entered onto the film by a microfilm recorder. In other cases, the output may be sent directly to the recorder. Usually, recorders project the image onto a CRT screen from where a high-speed camera photographs the displayed pages. A 4 by 6 sheet of film is generally called a microfiche. A microfiche storage capacity ranges from 270 page sized images in common microfiches to 1000 standard page images in an ultrafiche system. The information stored in these films is then read by users from screens of small desktop microfilm viewing stations. The index of the document locations is stored in the memory of the small computer connected to the viewer station. Thus, to retrieve any document, the user has to just look up the index, locate the correct file and wait till the required file is picked out from the thousands of documents. COM speeds can go as high as 32,000 lines per minute. COM recorders are very expensive and a high volume of jobs is necessary to justify its cost. You saw how voice recognition technology was used in input data systems. Hardware manufacturers have created integrated voice recognition systems that can not only receive voice input but can also respond via voice output. 
Many institutions and organizations use audio response systems to respond to human inquiries that are transmitted over telephone lines to a central computer. For example, when you call in at the directory inquiry through the phone line for a changed number, you will hear a voice response to the information you code in and a changed number, if any. All the sounds needed to process the possible inquiries and produce the voice output are pre-recorded on a storage media. Each sound is given a code and when inquiries are received, the processor follows a set of rules to create a reply message in code as a response to the inquiry. An audio response device receives this coded message, assembles the sounds in the proper sequence and finally transmits the audio message back to the station requesting the information. Audio response systems can be inexpensive and many are now available for use with personal computers. Audio response techniques combined with briefcase sized terminals turn every telephone into a potential computer input output device.